Awesome. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Um, and welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our third NACSAM webinar. For our theme this year, we have been talking about bridging the gap. And so we're super excited to be joined today by our colleagues at TrackTip to hopefully draw some connections between how to think about training CSAs or how to improve your reporting procedures for um, informing CSAs about their role and connecting that work to a more digital process or platform, which is how TrackTip will be chiming in for us a lot this afternoon. Uh, so uh, like Cheryl mentioned, my name is Laura. I'm the Senior Director of Programs here at Clery Center, and I've been here for about four years. My background is in counseling and higher education. I spent some time working as both a school counselor and also on a college campus in both residence life and student conduct roles prior to coming to Cleary. And my role at Cleary is really centered on developing curriculum and resources to help campuses better understand how to implement the Cleary Act requirements. And I'd love to toss it over now to our friends at TrackTech. Mark, um, please feel free to introduce yourself, and then um, we can also have Brian say hello as well, although I know he won't be presenting in the same capacity that you will be today. Perfect. I'll start. Thank you, uh, Laura. My name, uh, as the slide says, Mark Fulmer, uh, TrackTix Vice President of Security. I've uh, been here for going on four years. Um, I, in, in my role, what I get to do on a day-to-day -day basis essentially is, is work with all the teams from, uh, from development all the way through to, uh, to client success and product. Um, been in the security industry for about 20 years, mixture of kind of corporate security roles and uh, security service roles. And uh, my uh, my international certification uh, a few years ago. Uh, so I'm a CPT. I'll pass it over to Brian so you can do an intro. Yep, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Strasser. I'm Senior Director of Partnerships at TrackStick. I've uh, been with the organization for about a year and a half now. Prior to that, I spent probably the last 15 to 20 years uh, in partnership management roles throughout uh, other startups as well as, as within uh, enterprise operations such as Oracle, and uh, super excited to be uh, to be part of this uh, presentation today with uh, with Clery Center and a uh, huge thanks to them for for their support. And I will we'll pass it back to you, Laura. Great, thank you both so much, uh, Brian and Mark. So, folks that are attending. Our goal for today is to kind of give everybody a little bit of a refresh around what the Clery Act is high level, and then get a little bit more into what Clery statistics are, uh, what they represent, how they come to us, and then we're going to transition into talking about how to best streamline policies, um, sorry, procedures rather, around collecting that information. And that's where I'm going to invite TrackTech to come back in to speak a little bit more to the successful strategies that they have discovered in creating digital transformation of records management and what to look for when you are thinking about moving to a more streamlined, digitized process for maintaining your records. So the General Audit Clery Center is the national nonprofit training organization founded by Tommy and Howard Cleary, who are the parents of Dean Cleary, for whom the law and the is named after. Dean Cleary was a student at Abu Dhabi University in Pennsylvania when in the spring of her freshman year, April of 1986, she was raped and murdered in her dorm room. And her parents were obviously devastated by that loss and committed the rest of their life's work to developing not only local legislation that developed into state legislation that turned into the federal law we now know as the Cleary Act, but also committed to developing an organization, founding an organization, that would not only support the enforcement of that law, but would also work towards educating colleges and universities on how to create safer campuses for students and for employees. And so our work at the Cleary Center today mirrors that and echoes that vision that Connie and Howard had, and we have continued to drive it forward. And we really believe in the power of partnering with colleges and universities to be seen as an ally to help understand and break down barriers 
for how to best implement the Clery Act regs, especially taking into consideration all of the unique campus cultures that exist today. And we really try to honor and um, I'm sorry, excuse me. We try to honor that work through thinking through things both from a letter of the law lens or philosophy as well as a spirit of the law philosophy. And we like to term that as working with both mind and heart. So we're thinking about the requirements and what needs to get done from the letter of the law. And usually our minds are really helpful in thinking through those concrete items. And then we try to infuse all of that work with heart. Um, to come from a place where we are thinking through how to best elevate those requirements or personalize those requirements, taking into account, again, the unique situations of your campus. And so Clery Center is here to support your work as you think through the regulations themselves, maybe how to edit or improve things. We do all that work in honor of Jean, for sure. And today we're going to spend some time specifically thinking through what the Clery Act crime statistics are, how they're defined or described, and what they are designed to capture. And then we're going to walk through strategies for refining your own Campus Security Authority or CSA reporting procedures. TrackTip will support this conversation through these last three bullets tremendously as well by talking through elements to consider when developing a reporting system and then how to best determine campus partners to include in constructing and executing reporting procedures. As Cheryl was describing when she initially jumped on today, there are a couple of different ways for you to interact with us throughout the webinar. You'll see we'll pose some polls to you that you can answer. We'll also pose some discussion questions to you, and you can respond to those questions by submitting your answers in that group discussion field. You also can certainly ask us questions, and you can ask them um, to everybody by putting them in that group discussion pod. But you could also ask them privately by entering in them in the support or private Q&A pod. Sometimes the questions that are asked there are very applicable to the wider audience, so we won't identify who is asking them, but we might address that question to the whole group as well. If you are experiencing any sort of technical difficulties, we would encourage you to use that support or private Q&A pod so that our web producers, Amy and Cheryl, can best help you navigate those issues. Um, and then in addition to all of that, in that files pod, like Cheryl already mentioned, there are some resources available for you. There is the slides from this presentation itself, and they are in a handout version as well. And then TrackTech has actually created a Clery Act infographic that we would encourage you to check out at some point, either during or after today's webinar. So just to make sure everybody is on the same page, when we say the Clery Act, we are talking about a federal campus safety law that it was written as a consumer protection law. And so it is enforced by the Clery Compliance Division, which resides within the Office of Federal Student Aid within the United States Education Department. So Clery Center, who is running this webinar today, we are not the enforcement authority of the Clery Act, but certainly one of our major functions is providing what is called technical assistance. So when folks ask us questions about what Clery is or what it requires, we're able to provide general answers using our knowledge of the law and our knowledge and interpretation of the handbook, which is a document published by the Department of Education to assist campuses with interpreting the regulations. But we are not in a position to offer formal compliance determinations. So if you were ever to ask us a question such as how to classify a certain individual, like whether they are a CSA or not, how to classify a Clery crime specifically, or whether or not a piece of geography falls within your institution's Clery geography, we would be able to provide you with an answer of things to consider when making that determination, but we would not be able to provide you with a definitive yes, no, this is what you should do. For those types of questions, we would always refer you to a federal contractor that works on behalf of the Department of Education to provide technical assistance on the Clery Act, and their name is Westat. <coughs> and I'm going to put their information in the group discussion pod for you all. They can be reached by email address um, or by phone. We would always recommend calling, um, sorry, emailing so that you receive a response in writing, but they are very responsive and very helpful, and they are more in a position to offer those sorts of formal compliance determinations than Clery Center is. But getting back to the nitty-gritty of what the law calls for, um, and again, all institutions that receive federal financial aid are required to comply with Clery. Um, so that would be most colleges and universities in the United States. 
Um, what Clery calls for is it names a group of individuals as a reporting authority. They call those folks campus security authorities or CSAs. The law takes the trouble of defining who would be a CSA, and campuses are charged with identifying the roles on their campus that align with those definitions, and we'll get into that a little bit later on. Additionally, local law enforcement would be the source of some information around Clery Act crime statistics as campuses are required to reach out to local law enforcement for those that have jurisdiction within their Cleary geography um, to ask if any individuals reported Cleary crimes directly to that local law enforcement agency instead of the campus. So the reporting authority or the WHO are campus CSAs or campus security authorities as well as local law enforcement. Cleary Act geography refers to Cleary Act defined locations uh, that relate to an institution's buildings or property. And those categories are on-campus property, public property, on-campus student housing, and non-campus property. Non-campus property probably being the most difficult to understand because it is a unique term to the Clery Act. And it doesn't mean what you think it does. It doesn't refer to private property or off-campus property. Rather, it refers to buildings or properties owned or controlled by the institution that do support educational purposes of the institution and are frequently used by students, but are more than a mile away from the on-campus property of that institution. So this is a helpful distinction. Today we won't spend a lot of time going into the nitty of how to think about clear geography or how to classify locations within clear geography, but certainly if you have any questions about the topic, feel free to reach out to Clery at any time. We can answer those questions for you. We break down, in general, Clery Act requirements in an, an, in an annual and ongoing capacity. So in an annual capacity, institutions are required to publish a document called the Annual Security Report. And that document is due by October 1st of each year, so we're right in the heat of the moment with ASRs. That document will contain Clery Act crime statistics, which we'll get into a little bit more today, as well as policy statements, which are summaries of existing policies and procedures on your campus in a variety of campus safety topics and areas. And then in an ongoing capacity, campuses are required to evaluate reports of incidents to determine if they meet the requirements for issuing a timely warning or an emergency notification. And then they're also logging those reports within an institution's daily crime log if the institution has a campus security department or campus police department and if the incident occurs within the campus's patrol jurisdiction. And then um, lastly, in an ongoing capacity, campuses are required to provide certain rights and options to survivors of dating violence, domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. And those requirements came through with the most recent changes to the Clery Act, which came with the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act in 2013. And those latest changes went into effect as of July 1, 2015, so just um, a little more than four years ago. So that's just to get us all on the same page with a general reminder of what the Clery Act is and some general components that influence its implementation. But today we're going to spend a lot more time focusing in on what Clery statistics are and what Clery reporting looks like and who is involved in that process and then what you can maybe do to start refining or editing or evolving that process at your campus. So when I say the term Clery statistics, I am referring to reports of incidents that align with the definitions of Clery crimes. So the Clery Act notes certain crimes for which campuses need to keep statistics. We'll go through what those crimes are in a moment. And those reported crimes would have had to take place within Clery geography, so within those geographic categories I mentioned a moment ago. And those incidents would have had to have been reported to a campus security authority at the institution. If those three elements are met, then you have a Clery statistic. So Clery crime plus occurring in Clery geography reported to a CSA equals a Clery statistic. And so when you are looking at your annual security report, those statistics that are in there are from the past three calendar years. So the annual security report that's due October 1st, 2019, will have Clery crime statistics from 2016, 2017, and 2018 within it. So in general, there are four Clery crime categories. These are terms that the handbook for campus safety and security reporting uses, and I can put a link to that in here when I stop talking in a few slides. Um, but that's, I just mentioned that because these are the terms that the Department of Education uses to identify each of these four categories. 
some of them are a little bit confusing because in theory, you know, all of these are criminal offenses, but they use that term to describe a specific grouping of Cleary crimes. But they break down the crimes into criminal offenses, hate crimes, VAWA offenses, and then arrests and referrals for disciplinary action. So the criminal offenses are the original seven crimes that were written into the Cleary Act when the law was first passed. These are crimes that um, the Cleary Act uses the federal definitions for these crimes or the FBI Uniform Crime Reporting Code definitions for these terms. And so they are criminal homicide, which is murder and non-negligent manslaughter as well as manslaughter by negligence. Sex offenses, and so anything that meets the definition of rape, fondling, incest, or statutory rape as those terms are defined by the FBI's UCR and NIBRS or National Incident-Based Reporting System Crime Code, those would be considered sex offenses under Cleary. And then additionally, aggravated assault, robbery, burglary, motor vehicle theft, and arson, again, all as those terms are defined under the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting Code, those are Cleary Act crimes within the criminal offenses category. For VAWA offenses, what we are referring to are dating violence, domestic violence, and stalking, as those terms are defined within the Violence Against Women Act. Again, this law was reauthorized in 2013, and Section 304 of the Violence Against Women Act amended the Cleary Act. And there were a bunch of different elements that came into that to amend, uh, that, that amended Cleary but the majority of them were centered around the addition of these three crimes as being counted as Cleary crimes, and then certain prevention, response, and disciplinary procedures requirements that were put in place to address these three crimes as well as sexual assault under Cleary. Hate crimes are all of the crimes within the criminal offenses category, plus the four additional crimes of larceny theft, simple assault, intimidation, or destruction, damage, or vandalism of property, again, as those terms are defined within Cleary. Um, but those four additional crimes are only counted within Cleary crime statistics when they are motivated by a bias in one of the bias categories that we indicate here. So just one more time so that we're all on the same page. Hate crimes are any of the crimes within the criminal offenses category, plus the four indicated here, when those crimes are motivated by a bias on the part of the perpetrator that falls within one of these bias categories that are listed here. And then lastly, institutions are required to classify reports of incidents of arrests or disciplinary referrals for violations of weapons law, drug abuse, and liquor law violations. So that hopefully just gives you a grounding for what we are referring to when we say Cleary crime statistics. But in order to think a little bit more critically about our reporting mechanisms for getting that information, we should start with analyzing and understanding from whom those reports would come. And so for a Cleary Act perspective, the sources of your Cleary crime statistics are really two sources. They are reports coming from campus security authorities, and we'll define who those are in a moment, and then local law enforcement. Because again, institutions are required to request from local law enforcement whether or not reports of Cleary crimes were made directly to them if those, again, if those reports occurred within Cleary geography. So when you are reading your institution's annual security report, and you are looking at Cleary crime statistics within it, they are a question of reports made to either CSAs or to local law enforcement of Cleary crimes occurring within Cleary geography of our institution. And so when we say campus security authorities, this is who we are talking about. We are talking about individuals whose function at a campus falls into one of these four categories. So three are definitely a little bit more straightforward than the fourth. The first is campus police or security or public safety. So for campus police or security, if you have a function that falls within those types of departments, you would be considered a CSA. Individuals responsible for security that might not be a part of a campus police department or security department, so those would be your access monitors, which could be resident assistants, they could be desk attendants that might not be employed or part of your campus security department, um, they could be parking lot attendants, anything like that, folks that monitor or are responsible for access and security. Individuals or offices designated to receive crime reports at your institution. 
And then lastly, officials with significant responsibility for student and campus activities. And the term official is defined within the Handbook for Campus Safety and Security Reporting as somebody that is designated as one that can act on behalf of the institution. And so when you're thinking about roles on your campus, whose function falls into one of these categories, that would mean that they are then a campus security authority. Again, can't stress enough that it's their function that determines if they are a CSA, not their title or role or department that they work in, but the function that they have um, at their campus job, or, their, or not even job, but their time spent. So receiving a paycheck does not dictate whether or not you're a CSA. Um, volunteers at a campus whose function falls into one of these categories could also be a CSA. It could be a third party contractor, et cetera. And so we say all that just so we're all on the same page with what we're meaning when we say CSAs, so that we're all on the same page with what we're talking about when we say query crime statistics. So at this point, we wanted to um, launch a poll so that you all have the chance to respond to this question. And I'm sorry, my screen just blipped out for a second. Uh, can you all still hear me? Yes. I can hear you, Laura. And people okay. are responding to the poll. And it looks like other folks can hear you as well in the group chat. Okay, great. So I don't know what happened, but my screen like went to the poll and then it kind of clicked out. So I am just going to pause for a second and reconnect. So if you all could just hold, that would be great. Sorry, everyone. I appreciate your patience. I really don't know what happened. I touched absolutely nothing, but my screen went to the poll, and then it just kicked me out. So I'm just reconnecting right now. Um, okay. I am seeing what you all are seeing now. Okay, great. So thank you all for taking the chance to respond to this poll about asking whether or not all CSAs at your institution use the same reporting form structure system. Um, I want to keep in mind that we recognize that there are multiple types of groups that are required to make reports on your campus. Today we're just not going to be talking about folks like responsible employees or mandatory reporters because we want to spend some time just focusing on campus security authorities. But thank you so much for taking the time to respond to this question. Um, so yes, yeah, so it looks like the majority of you do – sorry, just waiting for it to load again. I apologize the majority of you do all use the same system for or same reporting form or structure for reporting query incidents, which is great. Um, what we are wanting you to take the time to think through today is whether or not those methods are successful, are helpful. Um, I think in most cases we are familiar with campuses using a similar structure, no matter who you are as a CSA. Um, what we are what we are looking at right now is what methods do your CSAs currently use to report those crimes. We'd love for you to describe that a little bit. So if you wouldn't mind sharing within the discussion question um, pod, I'm sorry, the group discussion pod, a response to this discussion question, what methods do your CSAs currently use to report crimes? Okay, great. So I'm seeing a lot of folks saying on online reporting. Some people are saying phone, in person, or in an email, and then online forms. Some people are talking about more structured systems like Maxient or something like that, so that's an existing records management system. So this is super helpful to understand how there is um, a variety of methods still in place. 
And so what we're going to talk today is about the, some of the values that come from standardizing reporting options or reporting forms, but also at the same time making sure that you have enough options or enough accessible formats for reporting so that all of your CSAs have the ability to report in the same way. Um, I see folks saying things like online form, you can report in person or a phone call, but we would prefer the online forms for tracking. And so a question I might be posing to the group is, if somebody does report in person or over the phone, is the recipient of that information then putting that report into an online system? I'm just holding for responses to that question. Okay, I see yes. Yep, I see most people saying yes. Okay, fantastic. And we recognize, too, that um, when we talk about things like moving to a more digital system for tracking reporting, that that's sometimes easier said than done as it's resource dependent, whether that's time, money, people, space. And so TrackTech is going to get into talking through and navigating some of those barriers as we get through the content later as well. Um, but what we at least know is that we are all in an age where paper documentation alone is no longer sufficient for documenting things like crime reports or crime incidents, even for the simple fact that you want that information backed up. And so if you do have in-person reporting options or less formal reporting options, like an email or a paper form, it's good to know that whoever receives that information at institutions in most cases is incorporating that information into some sort of an online reporting system. That's right, we want to talk through. And so as we get into thinking about how you can refine your CSA reporting procedures, what I was just talking about kind of speaks to this first point, are the benefits and drawbacks of an online form versus hard copy. I mean, thinking through things like volunteers at your campus might be considered CSAs, but they might not be issued access to an internal intranet system where folks can find an online form if you're a CSA. So that might be a barrier. So you might need to have opportunities for folks to submit a hard copy form or a verbal report. Similarly, if you make your CSA reporting form open to the public, then you have to account for the fact that you might get an influx of reports from people that aren't necessarily CSAs. So how would you navigate getting an influx of information as well? And I think the benefit to that online form and the elements that you would want to include in an online form is obviously navigating barriers like handwriting or things like that would be helpful. Um, but also, again, you're creating um, a digitized version of something for which you can hopefully have a backup. And so that's really, really helpful as well as you're thinking about records management. A thing that we've found to be really successful to include in any sort of CSA reporting form is two things. One, the option for folks to both describe the incident in a narrative format as well as indicating a crime category. I would say having just one or the other would not be successful because you are not wanting to rely on the fact that all of your CSAs have the same understanding of what constitutes a query crime versus not, which is why it's super helpful to have both of these elements present on the form. For example, somebody might indicate a weapons possession violation in the crime category and then describe a narrative that is about sexual assault. And that might be because there was a weapon involved and they don't feel like they have the authority to indicate whether or not the description of the incident meets the definition of rape or fondling or whatever it might be. And so you would want to have the ability to follow up with that person to see whether or not they meant that or why they checked that off or didn't. And certainly, you know, obviously, depending on how your campus runs a CSA reporting system, you might not require people to identify themselves. And so that might be a hang up in following up, but we can talk about that separately. Regardless, on the form itself, if you only allow people to check off a crime category, you're um, not necessarily able to ascertain the, 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 the nature of the incident, that you're just relying on who's reporting it to you and their interpretation of an incident, which might not be um, as holistic a process as you could do. And then if you are just including narrative, they might not be getting at the information that you need to have in order for you to make a classification decision. So you can include the fact that they can write a narrative, but you might even want to be as specific as saying, can you describe for us the location of the incident, the nature of the incident, when the incident took place? And then if you feel comfortable indicating the crime category for which you think this incident would fall, um, you know, both of those things can just be helpful elements to use when you're determining classification of an incident on the back end. 
Similarly, we have found it really successful to make sure that you indicate if information has been reported to anyone else. This is one way to try to combat double or triple reporting. Again, I say this every training. I have yet to see a foolproof, fully electronic, not manual process for data reconciliation for crime reports. Um, there still has to be a little bit of that manual element of data reconciliation at this point because people are reporting crimes that fall under multiple laws that have requirements. And so you want to make sure that you know, everything is being accounted for in the, in the right way. So taking that off the table for a minute, as that certainly is something that everyone would have to do, you might want to incorporate a question on your form that speaks to whether or not the person reporting this information reported it to anyone else besides the person submitting it. So that way you would know at least where to think through or where to ask um, or think about where to ask to make sure that you're not double counting information. And so then when you're thinking about your reporting procedures, these are some questions we would want you to ask yourself in self-reflection to get a better idea of your starting point. So where do all CSA reports go? How quickly does the campus review a report when it comes in? And why is that important? Because we're thinking through whether or not a report requires a timely warning to be issued, whether or not, whether or not the report the party or the victim in the incident report requires an explanation of rights or options or any other additional support services or accommodations to be offered to them. And please know that accommodations and support services are not limited to only offering, um, to only being offered to survivors of dating violence, domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. You certainly could offer those options to anybody. Clery speaks to a requirement of informing folks about rights and options when they come forward specifically in relation to dating violence, domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking incidents. But nothing prohibits you from providing that information to, say, the victim of a robbery or the victim of an ag assault as well. But then you might want to start thinking through, so how do reports get reconciled at our institution? Is that folks getting around a table once a week, once a month, once a semester? Is it one person doing it all by themselves once a year? Is that effective? Is that really getting at the heart of why you're reconciling? You know, you're reconciling not just to ensure that you're not double counting, but to ensure that you are accurately addressing all reports that are coming in and you're not assuming double counting has happened either. And then you want to start thinking about what data must be included in your CSA reporting forms versus what is nice to have. And then how do those data points translate into your online reporting system? So how does the information that you are asking for on your form then get filed away into an online reporting database or system? How do you account for those data points? Those are some things that we're going to um, let Mark and Brian talk through when we get to that section as well. How do you think through making sure that the information you're collecting is accurately represented in the system used to manage it all? So just so we're on the, all on the same page, you know, CSA reports must include at a minimum, and this is not must from a, the Clery Act prescribes this perspective, but the reports must include this information so that you as an institution have the ability to determine whether the reported information meets the requirements of a Clery statistic or not. So at a minimum, you need to know what occurred, you need to know where it occurred, and you need to know the year in which it was occurring and then the year in which it is reported. For Clery purposes, your query statistics reflect re incidents that were reported in that year. For daily crime audits, you are noting the occurrence and the date that the information was reported to an institution. And so with all of that taken into consideration, I'm going to pass it over to Mark and Ryan to start thinking through how are you managing me for having a streamlined reporting process, and how are you making things like digitizing that information or that process work for you to ensure that your process and procedures all line up and make sense. So I'm going to turn it over to Mark and Brian now, and I will definitely also be peeking through the questions to see if there are any I can answer um, on the back end, and I'll bring any questions that are important for the group to the whole group as well. Thank you all so much for your patience when I had to duck out a couple of minutes ago. But Mark, take it over. Great. Thanks, Laura. And it's also an opportunity for you to, to, uh, to catch your breath as you, uh, as you go through. And you quickly saw 
um, a question there, and it's just a, a, essentially a little bit of a re reflection or an opportunity for us to ask you how many people are responsible for working in and around um, uh, reporting today. So what we want, what we have the opportunity to talk about today is a little bit more about kind of shifting thinking and, and want to build upon, you know, Laura's comments in and around uh, reporting. And it definitely made it much clearer for, for us with respect to roles and categories. And um, as, as we shift our thinking, uh, considering the speed of change kind of going on in the world today, um, for example, social media adoption, you know, well over 2 billion people for Facebook, you know, Google answering anything in a few keystrokes, considering what Amazon does for us and Uber and Netflix and so on, consider the impact on people in general and sort of their lenses and perspectives on things and ultimately their expectations with respect to kind of day-to-day -day activities that we might be uh, might be working on. So we're going to look a little bit about the technology as the enhancer for reporting as opposed to a replacer, kind of re removing that fear and definitely agree with Laura with respect to, you know, some manual portions, you know, uh, or, or parts of it definitely still need to be part of the overall, uh, overall solution. Um, that said, you know, the volume of data being generated today uh, really means that we need new ways to harness it or at least new ways to make sure that we're capturing all of it and of course, the all of it was defined uh, defined previously. A um, couple of examples of growth and change uh, that are not necessarily reporting uh, related directly, but they kind of show the speed of change or, or examples thereof. Um, consider a, a recent study that I read. Uh, by 2021, 10% of new vehicles will have autonomous driving capabilities. That's compared to last year where there's only 1%. Uh, by 2022, 40% of new application development and projects and so on are going to have some kind of AI or artificial intelligence uh, component to it or developers on that team. And finally, organizations that bypass privacy requirements and, and are caught lacking in privacy protection can pay fines, you know, uh, well in excess of 100%. That's very general, not clear or specific, but very general uh, as, we, uh, as we go through. Um, we're a software company. We help, you know, we, we, we try to help people run sort of smarter or better businesses. Um, but in saying that, it's not just about technology, right? It's not, uh, it's not in, uniquely focused on uh, technology as, uh, as the answer. Um, it may be part of the change, uh, but definitely not the be all and end all. Uh, for the ultimate answer, uh, we like to say, in, you know, as you're, as you're reviewing change and reviewing the process that you have, because we're all at different levels with, with respect to reporting, um, you've got to get the right mix of people, process, and technology together to best solve a business problem or opportunity. So something that you want to do better today that you're maybe not doing uh, not doing currently. Um, comment about efficiency, just because you're doing something very well today doesn't mean you're necessarily as efficient as you could be. So that's just something also to, uh, to consider. And then for change to really bring about value, we're going to talk a bit about innovation and what that really, ne really means considering the connected society and kind of the current event current event technologies that are accessible to all of us today and, and ultimately how they solve real problems. Um, yes, in terms of reporting, but also in terms of overall efficiency and how things are, uh, are working together. Um, to be innovative may require you to get a little bit out of your comfort zone, uh, but again, uh, that, uh, that ties to uh, kind of people's lenses, people's expectations of, uh, of, uh, of today. Um, now, kind of back to specifically in and around reporting. Um, you registered today because, of course, the topic of clear reporting is, is of interest. So we're going to talk about some uh, specific uh, specific items. Um, considering the list that you see above, you know how you currently report. You know, kind of look through those lenses and and, and see how that addresses the uh, the current uh, comments. If you're considering change, um, I would I would suggest or recommend that how you set it up is absolutely critical. Meaning, you know, the incident categories that you're going to be adopting. Um, can they or can they not, you know, capture clear requirements and what else can they capture? Make sure, making sure that the mandatory fields are captured every single time uh, as things are, uh, are, be, are being delivered. And then the difference between incident management and incident reporting. Obviously, in incident reporting, you want to capture it. You want to take it a step further, obviously, for, uh, for incident management. Uh, choosing report types and templates to avoid that missing information. And Laura gave us uh, examples of things that needed to be uh, included. And, and where possible, you know, to kind of combat some of the handwriting, you know, as you're capturing, uh, you know, presets, drop down, text fields, really kind of help uh, in terms of uh, accuracy and then, of course, reduce and uh, reduce the review time. So um, ensuring that reports are readily available, tracking all incidents that occur by incident type uh, definitely is something to, uh, to consider. I'm going to keep going. Sorry. 
make sure that we're uh, we're lined up here. Um, real time, which we're not, but real time. Uh, uh, sorry about that. Uh, obviously, reliability in reporting is important. Uh, needing to be confident in the process is absolutely uh, absolutely critical. So let's look, looking at the points that are identified in the slide here, um, we can say that real-time reporting avoids incident creep. And by incident creep, I mean getting on top of something before it becomes even more uh, of an issue. So email notifications, I've, I've identified you know, to quote-unquote admins. Uh, in the list here, but it can be to anybody who would be an appropriate stakeholder or someone that you would need to alert uh, in a timely fashion. Um, then, of course, uh, systems that are flexible but at the same time remain consistent uh, in terms of how uh, information gets reported and that it helps with the uh, the consistency uh, portion thereof. Uh, dynamic questions. So, uh, depending on what the answer, depending on what the answer is in in a reporting scenario. Uh, that the follow-up questions can be uh, can be a little bit uh, a little bit different. Uh, risk reports is a term term used in, in incident reporting, uh, so not just text-based. You know, being able to add pictures, uh, being able to add video, something that can be done easily today. When you know, uh, or back in the day, I guess you could say that uh, in order to add an image, you need to use maybe an external camera, download the image, attach it to the report. All things that take time, and we know that in incident reporting, the longer something takes. The, uh, the less likely someone is to, uh, to properly report it. And then dynamic tracking in terms of where it's coming from and how it's, uh, it's being, uh, being reported. Um, we'll go on to going into transparency. Uh, um, and and rival transparency, like rival transparency, rival transparency, two items that are critical in and around reporting just in terms of confidence. Um, so transparency definitely helps, uh, helps build trust. And, and then as the uh, information gets it's reported um, information on an online system is uh, becomes timestamped, so uh, that increases, of course, the level of transparency related to uh, to the information that's reported. Uh, reports can automatically include GPS coordinates in terms of location. So whether you're you know trying to reflect the uh, the clear geography, where exactly the uh, the incident happened, that's uh, that can be helpful uh, helpful as well. Um, report approval process. So as things get submitted, they can be sent to the proper channels for approval and and uh, and uh, and collection, and then automatically populating analytics. And we'll get into analytics a little bit later, but definitely something to uh, to consider in terms of the the uh, not only the initial reporting, but then the reporting on the reporting. I guess as we uh, kind of layer it uh, layer it on. Take a brief side step, kind of into uh, into public uh, public security. So maybe a little bit away from specifically from uh, from reporting, um, accountability. Another one of the uh, the items that I like to uh, to talk about in and around uh, reporting and and just kind of campus enforcement. So um, the uh, the A of art: accountability, reliability, and transparency. But in the accountability side, is kind of um, really tying back to uh, the instructions on how you're collecting information and what you're uh, what you're doing and how you're going about that and getting those instructions out there uh, every time. So uh, when you have uh, maybe uh, interactions from security officers required in, in quote unquote high risk locations, maybe not the best choice of words there, but a place where there are more likely incidents, just making sure that the uh, the team and the staff that's, that's responding to that have the proper uh, have the proper knowledge to do it uh, do it properly. Uh, after officer safety uh, recording. So just being able to trigger that remotely, if you do have a sense that someone's um, someone needs to uh, needs to have you know virtual backup uh, per se, and then email notifications when a tour is finished is more again if you go back to high risk locations and where people are doing things that once someone is uh, completed, you know that they're away from from a certain area and kind of moving uh, moving on, uh, and again. Uh, easy ways to contact stakeholders when needed. We've we've touched on that, and then in terms of location, so geocoding sites in terms of where uh, where incidents are uh, are happening. Keep going, uh, and then final comment, kind of in and around that, uh, security staff compliance. So uh, different different interactions require different skills. You know, regardless from who you have uh, working on the reporting portions. So being able to track that. You know, an, an easy example is languages. 
Uh, so being able to assign the resources that have those appropriate skills as they, uh, as they go through, and then being able to track those uh, in a proactive manner with preset warning periods and, and definitely helps you supply, uh, support compliance and not be, uh, be surprised by, uh, by, uh, by something uh, expiring or you know, having to worry about that admin uh, sort of administrative headache. So kind of closing that loop on, the, uh, on those items, is, it just has, helps with the consistent, uh, consistent uh, service delivery. And Laura, I think this is back to you. Hi. Yes, it is. So what we are encouraging you all to do, and you know, track take note too that you guys can take some time giving your opinions and thoughts on some of these sections because we do have until 3.30 today, um, is we would encourage campuses to do a self-audit of what you have in place currently. So for you, what you're thinking through with your reporting system, we would encourage you to gather copies of all the reporting forms that you do currently use for CSA reporting. So if you are talking about online forms, maybe have access to the actual system used um, in order to appropriately conduct a self-assessment and practice submitting a form yourself. But then also if there are other options like a, an online form that lives elsewhere or if, say, for example, what I'm imagining is even at small institutions, you might have res life folks that are using something that they call an incident report form. And that functions as a CSA reporting form, but it's not the same CSA reporting form that you share with all of your academic advisors, for example. So let's call all those types of reports together and start walking through for each of them, do they capture all of the query required information, meaning if I took the information from this report, could I determine if the information presented qualified as a clery crime statistic? So would it be, you know, would it include spaces to talk about the location, the nature of the incident, et cetera? Um, does it identify which CSA reported the information? Now, I understand that, you know, you might get folks that will just fill in their name as anonymous when they submit that information as the CSA. And there is nothing in Clery that says that CSAs must identify themselves when reporting information. But hopefully, when you train CSAs, you are explaining to them that this is their role and responsibility to pass along you know, reports of Clery crimes disclosed to them to the designated crime collection body at your institution. And that in providing their identity, they allow for appropriate follow-up to happen from that designated crime collection body if necessary. And so you want to evaluate, is there space for a CSA to identify themselves on that, that form? If that's an online form, is that a required field that you're making people fill out? And again, I know that they can put, you know, anonymous, anonymous. But at the same time, explaining perhaps why you're asking for their identifying information so that should they have a question or want to do any follow-up, they know how to reach out to you, that could be a helpful thing to include in the form itself, so the reason why you're asking for that information, and also a helpful component to talk through in your own reporting um, information. I'm sorry, in your own training information. And so on top of that, you would start to evaluate are reporting systems used in addition to a CSA form? So like what I was just getting at, like is there a reporting form that all of your residence life folks use or all of your academic advisors use or all of your athletic coaches use that is separate and distinct from something that you call a CSA reporting form but serves the same function? And if, you, if there are multiple duplicative forms, is there any worth in consolidating and creating that one form that you use for all um, and or replacing some of those other extraneous forms? And then if the CSA places a phone call to the individual or department collecting information, who then documents that report? And we were talking about this earlier. We were asking you also if somebody does report over the phone um, or reports in person, does that person taking that information, what do they then do with that? And most of you said put it into this online database or reporting system, which is great. Um, but basically what we're wanting to get is there any way to find reporting process on the front end or back end? So that way you're ensuring you're getting the most amount of information the most efficiently possible. So here are some elements that we want for you to consider you developing or deciding on a report system. And when we say reporting system, we might mean the procedures by which folks report at your institution. 
Um, and then on top of that, a records management system to quantify or collate or analyze that information on the back end. So you want to ask some of these questions first. You want to, after you do your self-assessment and know what you have and know what you might want to improve, you then want to go back to what information do you want to collect. At minimum, that should align with the slide previously that was talking about the nature of the crime, the location, the, da the date or year it occurred. Um, but then on top of that, what other information would you want to know if you could know anything, right? What information do you want to require folks to include? How else do you currently gather reports of crimes? Do you use anonymous reporting forms? Do you use other general reporting options? And then what types of reports would you want to be able to generate from the information gathered in a records management system? I think that's one of the most important things to ask ahead of time. And I would love, you know, for Mark or Brian to jump in on this point because I feel like so many people feel like they've been let down by the records management systems they've invested in because they didn't spend enough time up front determining what capabilities they actually really wanted it to have. And so you want to make sure, that's why we encourage, you know, these two slides might feel really similar, the self-assessment and the elements to consider in developing, but they're two different, you know, aspects of the same coin. First, you want to self-audit what is in place and how is it working. And sure, you want to make sure when you're determining what's in place and how is it working, you want to know what you would need to have at a minimum, you know, so the, what the requirements are for CSA statistics, et cetera. But then in this slide, you know, what this is pie in the sky HGTV dream house slide. What do you want to collect? <laughs> what information do you want or wish you had required folks to include? How can we do that in a way that feels equitable and still a choice for people if you want to make it a choice? How else are you gathering information about crime reporting that maybe you weren't even thinking of? Did you realize that the student or, you know, um, child summer camp that your campus runs every year has its own crime reporting process? Because they say that you can report crimes to any of the counselors, but that information wasn't getting to your public safety department. You know, it's global, holistic questions like that that you want to ask to get a better idea of where things stand right now, where you want to go, and then how you would get there. And so then is the records management system or reporting system that you're thinking through marketed as a system for query reporting? And so if it is, what does that mean to that manufacturer? Because this is an area that we see a lot in Query Center world of people say that something is perfect or fully meeting all query reporting requirements, but sometimes folks on the other end aren't 100% clear on query, and so things are not lining up well. So what we would ask for is, you know, if somebody says that in their, you know, advertising of a system, or if somebody is creating a homegrown system at your campus and is saying that it is a system for query reporting, I would just as we train CSAs to say to a reporting party, what does that term mean to you, I would say to use that strategy here. You know, what does query reporting mean to you? What does a system for query reporting mean to you? What are its features? What are its capabilities? Um, and then these are just some things that we thought of that we would ask if somebody came to us saying, here is a new reporting system for query reporting. We would ask, does, does this reporting system have the function then of flagging incidents? Or do reporting parties need to indicate if an incident is query reportable? So what I'm thinking through is, do you have a way to set parameters where if an incident that has been entered into the system meets the parameters, now that is going to be flagged as query? Or does there need to be a manual flagging of something as a query reportable incident? Can you input query geographic categories ahead of time? Can you input query definitions ahead of time? so that when those things are met, at minimum, the system would flag, this report is most likely query reportable because it indicates a query crime and it occurred here, which is part of your on-campus student housing, you know, something like that. And then if it doesn't have that, you know, again, what manual processes might you need to implement to supplement its capabilities? Again, regardless of its ability to flag, we would always recommend a second double manual check on the back end in terms of data reconciliation because no system is perfect and you do want to make sure that everything that you think is matching up for query requirements would be reflected in that system. Um, and then not all of your reporting systems may be intentionally designed for CSAs 
like those designed for community-based reporting, and, and that's okay. You want to make sure it can be important to be clear about goals for using a product as well as the limitations that exist there. And Mark, I want to invite you to jump in on, on this slide as well. I know we're about to jump back to you, but would you want to add anything else to, to this slide here? Yeah, thanks, Laura. I think you made some fantastic comments in and around kind of taking the time to set it up and, and even before you set it up, taking that big, big step back and, and looking at something that, uh, that understands kind of your full picture. I mean, not all campus realities are exactly the same. So I think being able to understand the environment and all the potential sources of information are, uh, are vital. And um, capturing all the data, I think, is important. And then being able to kind of look back through those different incident categories and make decisions on that and then allocate the ones that are specifically uh, clearly, uh, sort of that would be clearly reportable information versus ones that uh, that would not be. And ultimately, I mean, there's a little bit of a list later that we can, we'll go through and we'll touch on quickly, but the easier that you make it to report and the less barriers that are there and steps for people to make, kind of the more information you will uh, you'll have. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And Mark, this might be a good time to um, pause and just see if folks have any additional questions. One has been posed in um, both the private Q&A and in the group discussion that I want to allow folks to, to respond to if they have ideas. Um, the question is being asked, you know, do any of you already use a CSA online reporting tool? And I think by that, you know, we were talking about a system or a records management system just for CSA reporting. Um, and what programs, if any, do folks use? So we'd love to give folks the opportunity to chime in here. So attendees, please feel free to respond to this question. We'll kind of pull, uh, pause for a minute. Um, but also want to invite folks to ask any other questions that might be coming up for you at this point before we move into another section of the webinar. So I'm just going to pause for a minute. Okay, so a lot of folks are chiming in here, and some of the folks that are spending are other areas of like, you know, Max, mentioned earlier, as some folks are here. Um, and I mean, I see multiple folks are typing, so it looks like some people are offering some other ones here too, RMS, Safe to Tell, things like that. Okay, great. These are really helpful, and they're, they're good for the folks that are attending just to get an idea of what some of the systems are that are out there. That's great. Thank you. So what we wanted to stress is this idea of evaluating what you have first, determining what, you, what needs to be met to meet requirements, and then what are the pie in the sky things that you would want to put in place in order to make those things better. Um, we would want to just stress that that process applies to all product and program selection. So you want to identify what you're looking to solve first and then ask questions about the potential, um, you know, products or services that you would use. You want to ask directly up front, you know, can you achieve these three areas? These are three things that at minimum we want to address by investing in this product, this program, this practice. Um, so this could apply for many different areas that would be clery requirements, like a bystander intervention program, um, implementing a new process for issuing no contact orders. You know, it doesn't have to be that because you're going to invest in a product that you buy, you would ask these questions. This is just a helpful strategy to use whenever you're thinking about making a change to a system, a program, or a process. And we just like to mention that because clery has a lot of systems and processes that you need to consider. Um, you know, for example, an emergency management notification system. You know, people are always talking about ways to streamline that process. How can you make it the quickest and most effective? Because Cleary often stresses that those should be multimodal. So you would want to identify first, you know, what is in place? How is it working? What would you wish could be better and why? And then when you're looking at possible solutions, how are those solutions addressing your needs? specifically. Um, I see that a lot of people are talking to about, you know, you do also have the ability to home grow a reporting system for sure. And so I see some people are like talking about how they've done that with other, you know, um, systems as well. Like you maybe added your own bells and whistles to something. So that's really helpful. Any other questions that we have at this time that we could answer for folks before we move on?
Okay, so then I'm going to turn it back over to you all, Mark. Right on. Thanks, Laura. Definitely not one-dimensional as we uh, kind of tackle the different uh, different items. And um, I mentioned earlier uh, analytics and kind of populating analytics, and it ties nicely to, to the comments uh, that you made, mentioned before in terms of what you want to collect and how do you want to collect it and kind of having some uh, some flexibility in and around uh, collecting it. But um, ultimately, the idea behind analytics is actually being able to use the data that you collect, regardless of the method. However, however you are collecting it, and and mentioned even earlier that just the volume of information. So being able to kind of sift through that in a way that uh, is as easy as uh, as possible. In in the uh, considering that we live in a sort of data rich world, and uh, so using anything that we can to uh, to kind of help help with that. And of course, non compliance is something you know in terms of reporting can be something that's costly. And then, um, but it's also uh, valuable from a kind of check the box point of view in terms of how else should we be looking at things and how else should we would we be looking at uh, issues and, and where where they would be. A um, couple of tips in and around analytics as we kind of go through and just gen very general suggestions and um, tying into the different uh, comments that uh, that were made uh, in the chat and the different uh, different portions. So uh, analytics should be on demand. It shouldn't really require. Uh, kind of, you can preset, but really being able to pull out uh, information and data when you uh, when you can, when you need them, and and, and as easily as possible. Uh, time ranges for reporting purposes, easy to configure. So uh, again, on demand and or over a set period of time, and you know whether it's one year, two years, or or you know three years or more. Um, consider that all reporting uh, sort of from the field should be pushed back into some sort of a dashboard to really kind of help you look at them and, and, and look at the incidents where they are. They should cover uh, incidents, uh, stakeholders, resource date, uh, time of day, to kind of really help you sort of look and, and, and analyze and, and adjust to uh, as, uh, as, thing, as things change. And uh, one of the questions I guess you should reflect upon is can you create your own metrics? You know, can you create categories that are Specific to you and, and uh, what you would uh, what you would want to see. I think this is a question that you put in, uh, Laura, in terms to kind of help us get into the next uh, the next piece. Yes, thank you so much, Brian. So we wanted to ask you all, what other offices or depart? I'm sorry, Mark, not Brian. <laughs> um, who do you work with most frequently on your campuses when evaluating reports? So we are talking about a report comes in and you're looking at it to determine whether or not it meets the qualifications for issuing a timely warning, whether or not it would classify or would be classified as a query crime statistic. Who do you work with most frequently in evaluating those reports? Please share those offices or departments in the group discussion pod now. Okay, great. So I'm seeing responses coming in about PD, student housing or residence life, Title IX office or officers, public safety. There is a leadership team, which includes the president, deans, associate dean of support services, OK? Um, a lot of references to student life, public safety, or police, housing. Um, and then some of you, I think you're indicating, you know, you take into consideration the viewpoints of all these different offices. But then who, at the end of the day, you know, what roles are, are you all representing that make the decisions? Because a lot of you, I think, are saying, like, I talk to all these people, but ultimately I make the call for either issuing a timely warning, I'm assuming, or classifying the incident. And so what roles do you all have? Or are you all talking about query center or sorry, query coordinator type roles or PD or public safety type roles? Please feel free to share to the extent that you're comfortable. And so I see a lot of query compliance officer folks, Title IX um, compliance or coordinator folks. OK, great. And then query compliance officers and the chief of police are working together to determine how it's counted. That's a great partnership. Great, wonderful. OK, and so I, I really appreciate all these responses, because what we wanted to highlight in this next slide and section are campus partners that you should be including in not just analyzing your reporting processes, but in also thinking through the reporting procedures that happen once a report comes in, you know, what you do after you receive a report. So both how you're streamlining the actual physical act of reporting and then analyzing information. Because I think there's a lot of ownership on the front end. Get information to a report. Get that information documented and reported in shape.
sometimes all of that application decision making or decision making falls on the shoulders of a few fewer and fewer people. And more of the streamlined reporting system, it frees up folks to be able to assist more with that decision making, um, especially around you know things like issuing a timely warning or classification. Now, obviously, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen could be a detriment or a barrier as well. But I think what's important is that you have folks aware of the processes on either side of submitting a report because that influences the way you edit and streamline processes on the front end and on the back end. So if you have folks that understand what happens after a report is submitted in an intimate way, then they're going to be an advocate for you in pushing for streamlining the process on the front end, because they know what ultimately has to happen. If nobody has insight into what happens after the report is made, they're not going to really be so invested in helping you understand the best way to improve that reporting process initially. And so what we included here were some roles that are most familiar to us as involved in either gathering reports or analyzing reports. You've mentioned a lot of those roles here. Some that weren't mentioned were like a director of athletics, a director of Greek life, a volunteer services coordinator. Um, I did not see many student conduct folks mentioned, but I did see residents' life, and I know sometimes they take on student conduct capacities. I'm, I now see a couple of folks identifying that as conduct as well. Um, and so, you know, are there any roles that you think that we're not touching on here that have become more involved in supporting the reporting of reports initially um, or analyzing them on the back end? I know you've all shared a lot, but are there any others that we're not thinking of? Feel free to take a moment to include those. Okay. Well, I hope at, at minimum that seeing this list and seeing other people, oh, I'm sorry, I see wellness coordinators. Yep, absolutely, depending on the function they serve. Um, if they are folks to whom individuals can report crimes at your institution, then absolutely they would be a reporting um, party that would be involved in streamlining a process on the front end or the back end. Um, I guess another question I kind of want to pose casually here, this isn't a slide, but to all of you that are saying that the campus partners that you work with are these roles, could you describe some of the tasks that you are involving them in? How, how are they working with you as a campus partner in a reporting process or in streamlining a reporting process? What are some tasks they've worked on? What are some projects they've achieved or worked on with you? Just waiting for some responses to come through. I see many folks are writing right now. And maybe you know you all are on this webinar because you are about to embark on a redefining of your process. And so you're trying to, to determine, you know, not just who you should involve, but how you should involve them. And so this would be great. Um, I see folks saying, you know, making sure CSAs have taken their training. Okay, so if you're using these campus partners to ensure that the folks that are charged with the role of being a CSA, understand the fullness of that role and its responsibilities, absolutely. Sorry, I'm just pausing because I know multiple folks are writing, so that can kind of take a minute for those responses to come in on our end. Okay, so reconciling the statistics, absolutely. Um, gathering the policies of other departments on safety and security to see um, if you need to include information in your ASR. So I'm assuming you mean statistics maybe from other local law enforcement agencies. So there are your campus partners involved in that. That's, that's really helpful. That's great. Okay, wonderful. So we hope that what you walk away with from this part of the conversation is a recognition of maybe you have not yet included other campus partners in this work and you've taken this all on yourself, or you have not received a lot of support in engaging other folks. <clears throat> and hopefully now you have some more tools in your tool toolbox to use to engage those other campus partners, um, especially if you are wanting to redefine a, a system or you want to utilize a process or a records management system that different offices would be 
coming into and using. Um, like I know some systems are set up where different folks can have different levels of access, and so that would be, you know, according to the role that they play on campus in terms of what happens when, a, you know, the lifetime of a report. But those types of functionalities and capabilities are really helpful to make that records management system user-friendly and um, capable uh, of being pretty flexible and adaptable. So with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Mark, who's going to talk through some tips to consider when you are thinking about transforming any sort of records management to a more digital version. Great, uh, great segue, uh, Laura. And uh, it was very, really interesting to see that kind of exchange of all the different people involved, the different stakeholders involved. So the more more involved, the tougher the tougher it can become. And this might sound funny coming from from software people, but uh, warning: the, the answer is not just about technology. So it really has to, you know, you have to take into consideration all those different stakeholders. And we'll get into a few other ones as well. And there's a little digital transformation comment or tip, uh, or sorry, definition up on the screen. But as you embark on the review and, and how you evaluate re reporting today, regardless of the maturity level uh, you're at, remember that change isn't easy, right, in terms of going about that. Whether it's from one technology to another, whether it's from no technology to some, and or adjusting kind of how it's done, it's definitely not uh, not easy. And especially when you factor in all those different uh, partners and stakeholders that you have to uh, have to address. and. Of course, it's an opportunity to seize it, but be very, you know, as careful as possible, considering that a lot of digital transformation kind of projects uh, projects fail. So we'll get into the next slide, which is just sort of a, I guess, tips for change, I guess you could say, and um, and kind of a stop and, and reflect. But um, they're listed up on the uh, on the screen. But analyzing your requirement, uh, your requirements, so what you're trying to do and what you're trying to get out of it, and what you really need and what you want to do, I think is important. And and as you embark, you, you know, looking at your kind of systems landscape and, and what speaks to what I think is a, an important step to uh, step to do. Uh, getting executive buy-in, uh, it's definitely a team effort, so it's not something that, you know, you should kind of embark completely on your own. Of course, some initial reflection on your own, but getting, you know, kind of those other stakeholders, you know, senior and uh, across the organization are, uh, are important. Understanding the cost involved, whether, you know, the kind of short-term investment and income for longer-term gain, uh, but understand the value, but you do and what you need to invest in. Um, a level team, uh, so make sure the right people are part of the process. I mean, you you need to do what is for you and what, what makes most sense for your campus and for your um, for your environment. But making sure that those people can ask, you know, kind of ask those questions and, and understand what uh, what they need to uh, what they need to ask. And then deciding on the best technology fit. And I remember sitting in a presentation. Uh, with someone from uh, from the NFL, and they had, had embarked on a, uh, in a in a role that she had had prior, embarked on a major kind of technology kind of shift, and, and they just adopted a whole bunch of new, different technology without considering how uh, they kind of fit together. So being able to uh, being able to do that, um, ultimately being able to test it, test it, and kind of play with it and practice, and kind of see what the fit is. And then searching for vendors, right? And Laurie made a comment before about you know kind of really validating that uh, the different vendors that you're speaking to actually understand what you know what it means and what the different uh, requirements are, and um, not sticking to the ones that necessarily you just know, but where do they fit within the uh, the overall overall uh, puzzle? And of course, the last one, you know, kind of understanding compliance. Compliance, yes, to uh, to the Clery Act, and um, but also the other rules and regulations in and around new technology, things that you can and things that you can't do. Um, as you uh, as you go through, um, and then as we get into a couple of kind of closing comments or kind of takeaways or items to uh, to consider, um, consider the lenses that you're looking through, and as you evaluate your position, and would would other people's lenses be the same uh, same necessarily as yours? Um, comply and create value where it might not exist today. So being open to that and kind of seeing, you know, what by doing it maybe this way or that way. That can kind of actually contribute to the value uh, across uh, across the organization. Um, absolutely, engaging other departments, and just based on the list from uh, from two slides ago or three slides ago, uh, there are multiple departments involved and in, in, uh, needing to understand what they need to do and want to do. Um, seizing the opportunity to impact the organization, and of course, you know, kind of being uh, being compliance focused. That. Brings us back to Laura. I think we get to talk about kind of upcoming webinars.
Yeah, yeah, this is a great time for us to pause and see if folks have any questions um, about any of the information we've shared with you all today. Yes, there is one more remaining NACSAM webinar next Wednesday, uh, but I can highlight that in a couple of minutes. We have a few minutes here, so I want to make sure that we take some questions from the room. Um, so if folks have any lingering questions about any of the information, Tick was sharing today or that we were talking through, please feel free to include them at this point. Um, there is, like uh, Mark was just mentioning, another NACSAM webinar coming out next Wednesday. It's our final one. It's going to be talking about the Drug-Free Schools and Communities Act requirement for campuses to publish a biennial review of its drug and alcohol abuse prevention program every two years. 2020 is the next year the campuses will be required to do that. So if you're attending that webinar, you will be very ahead of schedule. Good on you for that. Uh, but we'll be joined by colleagues from the Stafford and Associates as well as NASPA to talk about what DFSCA requires and how the biennial review can be effectuated successfully by prevention professionals. But today, yeah, I would really love to just answer any other questions that folks have. I see one that's coming through right now, so I can uh, try to pose that to us, Mark. So this says, on a reporting form, is it possible to ask for person of interest information. So you have as much information in case of a timely warning. Is this asking for too much information? Um, so if you're saying that on a reporting form, is it appropriate to ask for the reporting party to share information about a possible alleged perpetrator um, in an optional capacity? Uh, I think that would be up to your campus to make that decision. There is nothing in query that would prohibit that kind of information gathering in a reporting form. Um, I think what we always are trying to be uh, conscientious of is that, you know, we would assume that you would maybe use that information in determining whether or not to issue a timely warning and or including a suspect description in the timely warning itself. And I know we are of the philosophy of if you only have information about the race and gender of an alleged perpetrator, that that information alone would not necessarily help you identify definitively a perpetrator. So if you have a suspect or an alleged perpetrator description that would actually help you definitively identify that person, then it could be worth including that information in a timely warning. And so it might then make sense to ask folks if they do have information they're willing to share about a suspect um, in terms of their description, that they are more than will, you know, able to share that information. Um, so I don't see anything wrong with offering that as an optional thing for people to disclose. Um, there's nothing in Clery that prohibits asking for people to share that if they want to. I would not necessarily say that is required information for CSA reporting purposes, though. And yeah, yeah, I think, Laura, if I can just... Let me hear from... Oh, yeah, no, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, sorry, there's a slight delay there. If I, if I can just interject, it kind of ties back to the common in and around kind of incident reporting and incident management, um, but I definitely agree with you. It's, you know, kind of campus-specific and... Um, the more information, you know, when gathering reports, just having that option in there, I think is something that can be can be useful. But uh, I'd, I'd rather not comment on the uh, kind of the, the legalese of it all because I think it gets uh, gets to the <laughs> yeah, <slippery> sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, totally appropriate. Yeah. Any other questions we can answer for you all today? Uh, please make sure to also check out the. The infographic that TrackTech included is up here in the files pod. I also did say that I was going to share with you all a link to the handbook for campus safety and security reporting, which I will do right now. Um, this, again, is a document published by the Department of Education as sub-regulatory guidance, so meaning it, it is not the law itself, but it is guidance that the Department of Education publishes for campuses to use to understand how to implement query requirements. And there is language at the beginning of it that states that this is what the department uses as its own guide to determine if campuses are in compliance with the Clery Act when they conduct program reviews. So it is definitely a helpful resource to have on hand when you're thinking through things like meeting reporting requirements, et cetera. Are there any other questions that we could answer for folks today? I will include my contact information at the bottom here as well. If you have any other questions that come up for you, please feel free to email them to me. Um, we would encourage Mark and Brian to share their contact information in the group discussion pod as well if they would like to, so that folks can reach out to them with any questions they might have. 
Uh, and then lastly, as you'll see, Clery Center just included a link here. This is a link to a survey. If you would please take a couple of moments to complete this survey, it is super helpful for us when evaluating upcoming content and also seeing for covering future not only webinars but also future SAM campaigns. Um, we'll tell you again that we are um, really excited to bring you our final SAM webinar next Wednesday. If you have not yet registered for that webinar, you can do so by going to our next SAM and looking through the current uh, webinars for 2019, and there is registration information right there. And our free resources and social media guides are available there as well. But if there are no other questions, I would love to just turn it over to you all at Traffic if you have any last closing thoughts. Yeah, thank you very much, Laura, and, and, and the Clery Center for allowing us to, to partner up and, and present, uh, present this you know, eye-opening for us as we uh, you know, did the discovery and, and we're learning about clear reporting um, as recently as a couple of years ago, and then you know diving much much uh, deeper into the topic in the last uh, in the last few weeks, and uh, really um, has been a fun process, kind of in and around uh, talking reporting and and a little bit about technology and digital transformation. Awesome. Thank you all so much. And thank you all for choosing to spend part of your day with us today. We'll hang out here for a few more moments um, to see if there are any questions that come through. Again, please take a chance, um, take a moment to fill out that survey. But otherwise, thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day today and a great rest of your week.